Hi everyone, welcome to Type Talks. Today we have Chuck Pratt with us and I'm wondering if you could tell us a bit about you. Well, um, in the big picture, I am a spiritual uh, being on a rock traveling through space, um, trying to leave uh, the least emotional wake behind me as I, as I uh, go through life. Um, at a more detailed level, I'm a self-employed shop of one, operate out of my home office on Camino Island, Washington, which is about an hour north of Seattle. And I work on people development side of things. I think of myself as an organizational therapist. So I'll coach you. So that's one-on-one -on -one team build, um, you know, with groups or uh, working at the organizational level on leadership development. That is really rad. Chuck is one of the people who help qualify as an MBTI master practitioner. And you also have this very interesting blend between emotional intelligence, leadership studies, and type. And you are able to know the intersections between how these theories come together. And so that is wonderful and very blessed. <laughs> We're blessed to have you in the space. Yeah, and you. Mm -hmm, you identify with ENTJ preferences. And so I'm wondering, what about the ENTJ personality do you really resonate with? What are some of the traits, qualities, characteristics, or anything about ENTJs that you're like, wow, I resonate? Well, when I first started reading the type descriptions, um, resonate was not probably the word. Cringe was probably the word that um, that I would have in mind. Uh, reading about myself and, and you know, I think there's a lot of um, a lot of good writers in the world of type that have identified a lot of patterns in people's behavior, and um, I recognize some of those patterns. And um, you don't have to agree with me, but my belief is, if once you understand those patterns, it's incumbent upon you to start um, changing yourself um, and minimizing your impact on others. Um, so that's what I set about doing, and um, I. I, I try to uh, avoid being an ENTJ if I can. <laughs> yeah, I believe Carl Jung, he talks about type as if it's kind of a disease. You're figuring out a way to cure your one-sidedness. It's a diagnosis of your one-sidedness. So the areas where you may double down on when comfortable or just kind of like preferences that you lean on sometimes. And because of this, the cost of specialization kind of says that if you lean too much on a certain thing, the other thing becomes minimized. So if you lean a lot on TE, the more you lean on that, the more the FI <laughs> gets a little bit closed down. <laughs> yeah, if you um, looking at Jung and particularly Sharp's interpretation of Jung, um, the, in the purest sense, each of those eight uh, mental functions sound like pathologies. And of course, Jung himself says, you know, this is just one function and it's not balanced by the other in the way that I'm describing it right now. So. Um, yep. So it's a noble aim for you to figure out your areas of improvement and to aim to grow there. And so were you able to figure out that you had ENTJ preferences off the bat or did that take you time to figure out? Well, um, I was first typed in 1995 when my wife and I went through a couples workshop. My boss was offering, he'd just gotten certified and and had a number of us um, that reported to him come in with our spouses and, uh, and and do the MBTI. And I was typed accurately. My wife was typed accurately. When I read my type description and my wife's type description, I said, whoa, um, there's something here. There's something to this because they're kind of um, uncannily accurate in a lot of ways. And that started me to, to read uh, reading. And I read about a dozen books on type in the first year after uh, learning about the model. And then I went and got certified myself and, uh, and then later on started teaching certification courses. So. Yeah, you very wonderfully help people with learning about the 16 types more. So what type is your wife? My wife has ISFJ preferences. So we share one letter in common. That's really, really interesting. <laughs> <laughs> what did it teach you about your dynamic together? Well, I learned about type about the t same time as I was having my midlife journey. Sometimes people call them a midlife crisis, but it was a journey. And um, I'd been exposed to the, the concept of emotional intelligence around the same time frame. And I realized that um, as a thinking style person and my wife a feeling style person, that um, I had not been, uh, I had been clueless 
about a lot of things. And, uh, and so I, I decided to start trying to apply the model in, you know, at home and then working my way out from there. And um, I got really excited and, and put together a one day uh, course just concentrating on thinking and feeling differences. Uh, that we ran at a training base in uh, Central California in the Coast Guard. That is so awesome. What are some tips you would give for thinking and feeling types to communicate more effectively? I know you have a million of them, but yeah, um, <laughs> I, you know, the the literature suggests that the difference, big difference between thinking and feeling, is the decision process, and that's certainly uh, a biggie. But I wrote a paper some time ago and I built my w workshop on the notion that um, the biggest difference in my opinion is um, that uh, thinking types uh, want to improve things and feeling types want to build and maintain relationships. So there's a difference in the primary drive. And then that drives a lot of the other issues that, w that we're aware of um, in, in that uh, space. Um, so I think thinking types care deeply about people, but the way they show they care about people is by working on things, improving processes, making equipment safer, you know, doing a checklist so we don't forget things, that sort of stuff. Whereas feeling types are more you know, direct in the way they uh, work with people and, uh, and, and want to help them. So um, justice versus mercy is a thinking feeling dichotomy. Uh, truth versus tact is a thinking feeling dichotomy. Head versus heart. I mean, there's a bunch of them that flow out of that, um, your responses to conflict, um, a lot of those things. Interesting. I do find that TJ types tend to show love through acts of service in the five love languages, where, <laughs> whereas if your primary love language is words of affirmation, you might be kind of perplexed and confused at the ENTJ's form of love. <laughs> it's like, what is this foreign <laughs> love showing in a way? Yeah, and, and I've got a, uh, I haven't done it in a while because um, it takes a special kind of client, but uh, I have a type and couples workshop that I do. And um, we use, I, not just type, but I ended the session with the five love languages and having each person in the pair take a look at, um, you know, what language they speak. Because we tend to speak the same language that we want to receive and then we can be talking past each other. So, um, you know, Acts of service is my, was my wife's number one, uh, but that was not what I was uh, putting out there. So, um, what love language did you put out? Well, um, I want affirmation, um, and so um, I wasn't doing acts of service, so I wasn't getting affirmation. <laughs> um, so we fixed that. It's one of the places I think we've gotten better. That's fascinating. You mentioned earlier about how, now that you know that you're an ENTJ, you want to figure out all the ways in which you can not be an ENTJ. You can kind of grow to minimize your weaknesses. And so I'm wondering, what were the biggest growth points for you? How did you improve yourself? Ooh, thought-provoking question. Um, so a recognition, you know, that my communication style is very direct and figuring, you know, you know, it, it Neuroscience has now confirmed uh, what Linda Barron says uh, when she says BLM, which for our purposes here means be like me syndrome. The only way your brain can operate is everybody's just like me. Um, and so, you know, I would say something that wouldn't bother me or offend me. And so therefore it wouldn't bother or offend you. And uh, learning especially about thinking and feeling um, made me realize that, that that's not so. So um, how to honor my own desire. And I I still have a bias. Um, I know it's a type bias, but it's also a consulting bias that um, I think uh, more frank, open, and candid conversations in, in organizational life would be helpful to organizational life. And I know all the well-intentioned reasons why we tend not to do those things. But uh, so, um, you know, that was, that was a huge piece. Um, I was, uh, you know, I, the Coast Guard let me command a, a ship with a crew of 16, and it was a $15 million replacement boat. And I was upset with myself because I couldn't remember where I left my hat or where I left my sunglasses. And I go, you know, I would go through half a dozen pairs of sunglasses a year. And it was great for my self-esteem to, uh, to realize that I was an intuitive person. And that just, you know, is not a natural thing for me. Um, and, and, uh, I think there's a lot of, a lot of intuitives that learn, uh, some affirmation from 
learning about that that difference, right? So. Yeah, absolutely. Figuring out <laughs> the intuitive preference and why I don't have real world common sense sometimes <laughs> is like, whoa, all right, these day to day practical yeah, things. I have an idea, right? And in the moment, <laughs> the, the idea is energizing. I don't really want to hear as I'm energized. You know, we tried that once last year and it didn't work, or, you know, those guys, those are, um, you know, downer kinds of conversations. But there are people that who mind that are very practical and they think along those ways and, uh, and they can be helpful. Um, if we can figure out how to, you know, when and how to do those things, um, you know, valuing differences is a very difficult proposition. Um, our brain is wired to distrust difference for safety reasons, comfort reasons. And, uh, and so the, you know, the, the one big picture person, um, on a team with nine, you know, detailed people can either be seen as, you know, offering some value, uh, in the diversity of the way you think to the group or, you're this outlier that's always over there trying to, you know, stir things up or something like that. So, um, valuing differences is is, uh, is difficult, but it's essential, I think, in uh, for folks to get along with each other. But first, you have to know these differences exist, right? Because um, everybody's just like me says that that you know that there's no differences here, right? Yeah, looks can be deceiving. It's like with other movements, you know, Black Lives Matter, you can actually see externally that people are different or with other movements, they're more apparent. Like you can actually see, oh, there's diversity there. But when it comes to neurodiversity or cognitive diversity, it's harder to spot because you assume, hey, that human being looks like me. They must think like me too. That micro difference in perception where it's like, you're not actually like seeing how that person's different than you can cause a lot of conflict built over time yeah. and so when we figure out how our neurology is different than those around us we learn to respect different ways of operating and we can almost optimize our relationships or optimize how we get along so that we treat people the way they want to be treated we learn the platinum rule yeah. so it's amazing uh, <laughs> and then, well said well said thank you and so I wanted to ask you about how you experience extroverted thinking. How does that appear in your life? Well, gosh. Um, one of the simple ways I would um, describe it is, it, let's say that I'm um, flying and I'm I've deplaned and I'm walking, you know, out uh, down the jetway and into the, uh, the larger airport there. And I automatically look in a specific place for a sign that says baggage claim, for example. And if it's not there, you know, there's a little little voice that says they really should put a sign, you know, right there. So it's it's as simple as that. And I think for most of us, our our dominant process is hard to describe, hard to think about. It's just so you know natural and easy. And for each of the eight Jungian functions, I have a um, I have a mental picture of what that looks like. And my mental picture of extroverted thinking is a broadsword. It takes a lot to swing it. It cuts deep. Um, bull in a china shop is, uh, it would be my second choice. Uh, extroverted thinking is very uh, black and white, um, you know, very uh, closed. This is the way things are. And yet the world, I think, would be um, remiss um, if, if the, some of the structures um, that we have in place to help us with our day-to-day -day living weren't there. The, you know, the Dewey Decimal System. At one point when books were in libraries and people actually went there, um, you know, being able to find where a book is by looking up the Dewey Decimal System, that's, a, that's an extroverted thinking way of uh, organizing uh, books. So I try to live uh, in my introverted intuition as much. I find that I'm much more um, successful, uh, in, especially in interacting with other folks. Makes a lot of sense. So extroverted thinking as a process, it's very good at looking for improvements in external systems. It's like, oh, that a light could be added there to make this more, this pathway more lighted up instead of it being totally dark and everyone cannot find their way to the entrance. It's really good at criteria. It's really good at critiquing. And I like critique, not criticize, because there's two different things there. Um, good at critiquing and, um, you know, fast at, at those kinds of things not always uh, welcomed <laughs> uh, 
but uh, but the, you know that's in the wheelhouse, if you will. So. I love the sword imagery. And so, how do you experience introverted intuition? What is the image you ascribe to that? There is a, a series of paintings for the eight Jungian functions by um, a, a woman. She's passed now. May she rest in peace. And her husband, may he rest in peace. Um, Bob Boozer and Bonnie Boozer, and um, they're kind of abstract art. And the introverted intuition picture works really well for me. It's a keyhole, and you look through the keyhole, and you see another keyhole, and you see another keyhole. And so everything is connected. Um, everything is possible, whereas, um, I, you know, I, I, I would describe extroverted thinking as kind of black and white. Everything is gray with introverted intuition. Everything is paradox. Everything is possible. Um and so, you know, spending some time in there um, helps balance out that that broadsword. <laughs> That's an amazing image. With NI, it really does have this quality of embracing the paradox and sitting with the gray and almost seeing the shades of color and everything, too. It's not just seeing gray, but it's seeing how it's not just green. It's green and blue and red and purple, and it's nuanced. So it's seeing all of the conceptual nuance and distilling it. <laughs> We're on synthesizing, yep. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, uh, and so for many years, my uh, intuitive insights, I, my extroverted thinking would kind of you know, censor them. Um, you know, that's, that's crazy talk, you know. Um, or the, I'd have an insight and I'd have to say, well, you know, okay, that, I believe that insight, but how do I, how do I really trust it um, by, you know, somehow proving um, that that is so. And it, strangely enough, I, I, I learned to do meditation way back in 1976. Um, and to this day, I'm, I'm surprised that my extroverted thinking didn't um, trump my introverted intuition when I was, uh, when I was seeking that. So. Mm. so introverted intuition, it is a slower process. And sometimes TE doesn't necessarily want to slow down to embrace its introverted, more introverted side. And so meditation, it seems like it really helps you get more in touch with the NI within you. And so I'm and wondering- Introverted feeling, I think as well. Yeah. It's like when you tap into the introverted processes, you don't just tap into one, you end up tapping into them both. When an ENTJ taps into their NI, they also tap into their FI too. Uh, the only thing I would add um, to the, the comment about NI taking, you know, having, uh, needing some time, which I agree with, is sometimes um, it, it can be instantaneous, an instantaneous fly sort of insight. So I'm talking with somebody, they say something and the little voice inside my head says lie. And, you know, I've learned to trust that um, when in earlier times I, I, I didn't, so. Yeah, yeah, it can it can be a flash too. It's like an aha moment as well. Yeah. Makes sense. And so, how do you experience extroverted sensing? Well, um, retrospectively, now learning about um, you know the, the ages and the development of the of the processes, I can look back and say, um, you know, I uh, I spent um, four years on two different ships when I graduated from the Coast Guard Academy. And then I got command of a, of a patrol boat. And I thought I finally had the time to uh, start cooking, start gardening, and start uh, w working with wood. Um, as it turns out, um, that was just my extrovert sensing saying, hey, um, you, need to, you need to start working on this kind of stuff. And in NT fashion, you know, um, reading the books, um, getting the best tools that you can afford and all those kinds of things, you know, you want to be competent at and all those different things. And, and so uh, um, cooking allowed me to get my creative side out, designing, um, you know, I had a Triumph TR6 at the time. I developed a, a little wooden center console that was kind of an armrest and I could put things in, you know. They didn't have those back in the days. Um, so I just I designed and made one and, and enjoyed doing that. That's really great. And how do you experience introverted feeling? Well, um, about the same time I was, um, you know, uh, working, started working on myself, um, I was reading about introverted feeling. And, uh, and I was, uh, once I read the grip experience, um, I was very, you know, that I really resonated with that uh, particular piece. 
but at, at some point, I, I, you know, I think ENTJs are one of the types that are prone to workaholism, and 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 I like work. I still like work. Um, and but I was I was staying late, and my wife was not happy that the time I was getting home, and um, and so I, you know, I was kind of like blaming the Coast Guard, you know. Um, and then I realized it, this was self-inflicted stuff. Um, I thought I could add value to things. I was interested in things. Um, so I, I was overextending myself and I hadn't learned how to say no. And introverted feeling was very helpful in what, you know, what's at my core, what's really matters, what's important. And then, at, you know, and I, I, I kind of sat down and, and wrote uh, uh, some of that stuff out. And then when somebody would come to me and say, hey, Chuck, would you like to be on this team to do this? You know, there's a side of me that was saying, yeah, that's interesting. But, you know, how does it fit with, um, your, you know, your core stuff? And so um, it helped bring balance into my life. Um, and, um, you know, I'm, uh, I, I have lots of different ways of thinking and, and saying it, but um, I'm an idealist at heart, and I believe that human beings are capable of creating better organizations, better organizational cultures. And so, you know, I'm kind of on a mission uh, to help do that. I, I uh, you know, type helped me become a better person. And so however misguided my notion might be, I believe it has the potential to do that for everybody. Um, and so, and, and I think, you know, emotional intelligence, a bunch of frameworks that, that I'm aware of, you know, my coaching work, my clients are getting those frameworks. They're learning about type. They're taking, uh, uh, you know, the emotional intelligence measure and, and those sorts of things. Yeah, it does seem like developing introverted feeling helps balance out your extroverted thinking. So being more in touch with your FI actually helps balance your TE. And so you actually learn to do what matters to you and to not neglect your relationships or even yourself for goals or for results or for projects. Yep. Yeah. And so you mentioned emotional intelligence and leadership. And so I'm wondering how you integrate these with type. Well, I think the very first type conference I ever attended was in 1997. And um, I, I, there was a, pro, uh, a, a session there, one of those 60 or 90 minute sessions, I can't remember what, but uh, Gordon Lawrence was, was um, going to be presenting. He's the people types and tiger stripes guy, a brilliant ENTP. May he rest in peace. And um, the buzz in the room was finally um, feeling types are going to, you know, we're going to see what value they add. Um, that was what emotional intelligence is supposed to do. Uh, but if you look at emotional intelligence, it's a lot more complex than just thinking and feeling. And it's really, um, if you have a good emotional intelligence, life is less of a struggle. It's not that it's not a struggle, but it's less of a struggle. It's a resource, a very powerful resource if you can access it. And I don't know if you're familiar with Robert Keegan's um, vertical development model um, um, in, from his book In Over Our Heads. And, you know, um, I think uh, he, his research indicated that over half of Americans um, in his sample, which was mostly um, middle class or, you know, um, upper income, well educated, um, less than half of them had evolved to a place that they could manage the complexity of life. That book was written in uh, the mid 90s, research done mid 90s, published in 98. And I would say to you that the world was much more complex on one March of 2020 than it was in 1998. And since um, that date when pretty much COVID hit, it's gotten even more complicated. And so I think even more people are in over their heads. And, you know, one of the ways I think about what I do is how can I help people with um, frameworks that help them manage the complexity of the world? And I think Carl Jung's psychological type model is a foundational framework. And so, you know, everybody that I work with, I try to persuade them to, to get exposed to that. Or if they've been exposed to it, how can we you know, deepen the knowledge with some advanced uh, you know, stuff. Uh, everybody, everybody I work with, I try to get them to take the emotional quotient inventory, which uh, MHS up in Toronto, in your neck of the woods there is the publisher. Fantastic tool. Um, the scarf model from David Rock. 
um, a framework for psychological threat. There are frameworks that if people understand them and apply them, can help them manage the, the complexity of the world and we're feeling less um, overwhelmed. Yeah, having frameworks to navigate the world is really great. Being able to put all of these concepts that we deal with in day-to-day -day life and distill them down into core archetypes or fundamental ways of seeing it makes it easier to go through and to figure out what to do. You know, um, people behave in patterned ways and different uh, observers have, you know, called out different models, different vocabularies, different measurement tools to measure those patterns. Um, and if you are, the more unconscious your pattern behavior is, the more you've painted yourself into your own box. And when we make the unconscious conscious, then we, we give people the freedom to choose to be different. Um, so I think type and some of these other frameworks are very empowering uh, models rather than you know, limiting models. Sometimes people think that type is putting them into a box, but that's not true. It actually tells you what box you're already in, what patterns you're already playing into, and it teaches you, all right, now that you know your patterns, then you know how not to do this. So now that you know you're an ENTJ, now you know what to do to be less of that so that you're no longer controlled by the patterns you automatically play into. And I believe you're familiar with the Enneagram. And one of the things I love about the Enneagram, that's another one of my frameworks that I use with clients, um, is the notion that your personality is a cloak. And um, you put that cloak on to go interact with the world, um, but you don't have to put that cloak on. And um, that's a challenging notion for some people. When I've talked about that, sometimes I go, well, if I'm not my personality, what am I? Well, that might be one of those existential questions, right? <laughs> Um, you know, spirit, uh, light, uh, energy, you know, I don't know, you know, pick your answer that, that works for you, but, uh, but we're more than our personalities. Our personality is, is, is part of the ego. And um, the more we operate out of the ego, the more we get into trouble and the more we can, you know, get in touch with our authentic self or our greater self or our true self. Um, different people use different languages, but, but the real you is, is not the person that's you know pointing your finger at somebody. The real you is the person kind of over your shoulder watching you embarrass yourself, um, and, and you know the silent watcher is what the, I think the Buddhists call it. So mindfulness meditation helps um, develop that that inner awareness kind of a piece. Yeah, you are not the action. You are the person observing the action, or you are not your thoughts and feelings. You are the person observing your thoughts and feelings. Yep. Yeah. It's like your thoughts, feelings, personality, and most things are the clouds and you are the sky. So you're way bigger than those things. And yeah. <laughs> I've not heard that one before, but there's a lot of beautiful metaphors that, that, that describe that, um, that concept. Another one to kind of describe it is there is the projection you know if you have a movie device there's the thing projecting the movie device and then you are the projector of it yeah <laughs> anyways the the moral of the story is basically you are the observer you are not anything that you are going through or or anything that you're thinking of that means a lot of detaching it means a lot of stripping yourself of labels a lot of spirituality has to do with disidentifying with smaller labels to know who you actually are beyond those things. Yeah. And so I'm wondering, Chuck, how do you combine leadership with type? Well, I, you know, and, and um, we, you know, I've got four courses at qualifying.org and, and each of them uh, earn CEs towards master practitioner status. So if you, if you've been there, you know, there's a, a course on leadership development. And it, um, it looks at Roger Pierman's really good research looking at leadership characteristics and then matching that up with the eight Jungian functions and even has a measurement tool to measure um, you know, how you're doing uh, as a leader on those eight mental functions. So Roger Pierman says, um, you know, you're hardwired to do leadership in a certain kind of way. And um, I don't think any one type, despite some of the you know, nicknames and things we have for the types. I don't think any one type is is destined to be a great leader. We, we all have to work at it. Um, we all have to, leadership is a very difficult task. It's one of the most difficult things that human beings 
can be called upon to do. And so, um, you know, type helped me realize that if I'm leading people and I've got 16 different types, I got to lead. I got, I really need to be 16 different kinds of leader. And that's hard to do. It's hard to be flexible, but flexibility is one of the key pieces uh, around leadership. And you can be more flexible when you realize that that other person who's behaving very differently than you is not doing it to make your life difficult. They're doing it because they have a natural, um, you know, wiring in place, a natural energy drive to be exactly the opposite of you. Neither good nor bad, right nor wrong, it just is. And how are you going to figure out how to work with that? So helping leaders uh, flex um, is important. And I think the, the Myers-Briggs framework works around that. Um, I think more people get in trouble in leadership by overdoing their strengths than by their limitations or weaknesses. So helping people recognize that, you know, extroverted thinking, uh, being direct when you're in a team and it seems like you're not being treated fairly, you know, I'm the guy that's probably going to speak up first about that. Um, but, you know, if my wife comes to me and says, how do I look in this outfit, honey? That's not the time to use extroverted thinking, right? You gotta, you gotta flex to someplace else. <laughs> uh, and so, um, you know, learning that, uh, here's where my strengths are helpful and I should use them. And here's where I need to drop back and punt and, and move to another uh, one of those mental processes. And, and you know, and again, my mentor is Roger Pierman, and, and I'm quoting him. But as a gross uh, overstatement, um, most people have only developed 25 percent of their capacity. You've got a dominant and you've got an auxiliary. Most people if have gone through normal type development are, are relying on that. Um, and then how much you've developed any of the other 75 percent is dependent upon did the environment force you to? Did the environment encourage you to? Is there, is there something inside you that's driving you to? Um, you know, uh, what, what are the internal and external factors? Um, and so, uh, you know, the book You, which I think is is where type has evolved to. Um, I hope it evolves further, but that, that book basically says your developmental needs as a leader are predictable by your psychological type. And the book tells you what they are. And that's why I said when I read my chapter, I said it was painfully dead on. So, um, it, it, you know, um, there's patterns um, and uh, and there's uniqueness. Uh, there's seven and a half billion types on the planet. And um, 16 types is a pretty useful framework for, for thinking about things. Yeah, it's a very efficient and effective way at looking at things, which your extroverted thinking may <laughs> really like. And so... It is true that you can kind of distill things down to certain frameworks and they can be very helpful to understanding things. You mentioned a few of the frameworks that you use in coaching, emotional intelligence, and Roger Pierman too, I believe. Are there any other models that you use in your coaching? Well, <laughs> um, I, I, this is, um, this is a, an NT thing. It's not exclusive to NTs, but, um, you know, we, uh, we NTs tend to eat, sleep and breathe, um, processes and systems. And so, um, I've got hundreds of models in my head and, um, I try to trot them out when I think they're going to be helpful to my client. And sometimes I can take one or two and, and, you know, cut them apart and reassemble them and into something, um, you know, completely new. Um, so uh, there, I, you know, I've got lots of models. Um, the uh, Harvard Business Review has a, I think it's called Beware the Busy Manager, that has the energy focus matrix, and I find that is helpful um, to leaders for them to know only 10% of leaders are high in both energy and focus, and the largest number of leaders are 40% are distracted, high energy, um, low focus, and you know, it's not just your brain's ability to pay attention to things, but how many, um, how much stimulation are you getting from the environment? I mean, most people are getting more emails in a day than they can humanly process. Um, we've got more information coming at us than we know what to do with. And, and so being able to figure out and focus on uh, what's the most important things and, and keeping your energy up. So that, that's a nice framework for thinking about um, how can I have more energy? How can I focus better? Um, I mentioned the SCARF model, which is social or psychological threat. And um, the the notion of fundamental attribution error, 
Uh, Ooh, so yeah, that one. one is. Uh, just as light of inference, there's a whole bunch of people that have different models, but that's one of those ultimate truths I think about human beings is, you know, we have a tendency, our perception is awful. Um, and then we, you know, we go to bat trying to uh, to defend our perception um, instead of examining it more closely. So reality testing in the uh, EQI model is, is one of the things we measure. Um, people good at reality testing say, you know what, none of us ever see reality. We only have our own filtered version of it. And our filters, I mean, if we brainstormed a list, we'd come up with at least 50 things that are filtering, um, you know, how we perceive things. So there's, there's no sense doing problem solving or reacting to things or getting emotional about things until we've spent some time, um, you know, thinking about is my perception accurate? Um, I have this emotion, but is it based on accurate information? The fundamental attribution error is a quite a fascinating way to look at things because Diagnosis is one of the most important parts of the problem solving process. And so when you get the problem diagnosis wrong, like you're misperceiving the whole problem and what the problem actually is. And you cannot solve the issue because you're spending all of your energy trying to like solve a problem that isn't actually the problem at hand, but you misdiagnosed it. So 90% of solving a problem is actually getting the right problem to solve instead of accidentally picking the wrong one. Um, and it happens more often than not. Sometimes we think certain people in our lives, we might be able to help them in a certain way by doubling down on the things natural to us. But maybe those things may not be helping the problem. It might be amplifying it. And, and so it, yeah. Hmm. Well, the point that I'm trying to get at is when something doesn't work, don't try harder. <laughs> like it's, it's probably the problem is not the problem that you think that it is. And yeah. that looking at the situation in a new type of way with the frameworks that you mentioned and, yeah. or uh, frameworks that exist may shed light on a potential blind spot or something that you haven't considered yet that may actually be the yeah. more point of relevancy there. So my purpose for asking you about all of these theories that you practice is I want I wondered which ones were most core to how you understand reality in the world. And so I was like, hmm, what are what are Chuck's most go-to frameworks and ideas? I'm wondering about some life lessons that you've learned through living life, some things that have really stuck out to you, like some maybe core principles or lessons that you took out of books or lessons that you've learned yourself. What are the the lessons that you take away from from life, and I, mean, so, I think every every type practitioner has got good stories about you know the things we learned along the way about type, um, and for me, a lot of those became exercises in in workshops, um, you know, kind of doing a riff off of that sort of thing. Um, I had a personal goal for uh, over a decade to read one professional book a week. And um, I, the best I ever did was 45 in a year, and the worst I ever did was about 25. So over the course of time, I read a, a lot of books, mostly about you know spiritual people, uh, psychological self-help, leadership development kinds of things. And and so you know if you look at the fundamental attribution there, there's you know you can pull you can pull up six models from different people, different languages, different ways of representing it, but they're all talking about the same concept and they discovered it kind of irrespective of each other and, and um, or without knowledge of each other. So th there are some ultimate truths, I think, um, about you know, human beings and, and uh, things that would be helpful to us. So when I read a book, I want to I want to take one nugget away from it. I'll take more if I can, but I'm, I'm always looking for one thing that that is going to influence uh, the way I think about things. And uh, uh, you know, I think you're in your bio, you're a strengths finder person. So um, input is is one of my top five and learner is uh, in my top five. So I'm constantly, you know, seeking input um, to learn. And so that's you know, journal articles, um, you know, getting lost on the web, making, you know, rabbit path connections from one thing to the next. I spent, um, a, a, you know, I started with you and then I you know, I spent a, a bunch of time branching off and uh, found Michael Pierce and you know, some other guy. Uh, you mentioned uh, type hackers. I think it's, it's um, mm -hmm. you know, one of the references I saw that I kind of put a bookmark on. And I want to go explore. So that's really cool. 
the fundamental attribution error is one of my core models too for understanding the world. It just really hits me hard how our perception changes our reality around us. The Pygmalion effect is one of the core things that I also base things off of. It's basically your expectation of someone actually impacts their performance. I remember models because of the implications that they have on how we live life. And so if you know that the way that you treat someone and how, what you believe of someone actually creates the results that it may have not even existed in the first place, then it makes you more conscientious of how you really are going to orient yourself because you realize that, wow, everything I do actually has a ripple onto the world, whether or not I pay attention yeah. to it. There's a lot of unintended consequences that come from actions. Yeah. And so typology models are good for helping you understand the unintended consequences you have on the world. Because it's like, I didn't mean to offend that person, but I did. And it's because they're different than me. So we, we are having unintended consequences everywhere in our life all the time. Yeah. And that's where I, you know, I, early on in our little talk here, I, I talked about emotional wake, and that's a great metaphor for, you know, if you if you're driving a boat through a, uh, you know, a, a, a uh, marina, you know, there's usually signs five miles an hour, and um, if you if you go too fast, you know, you put out a wake that starts all the other boats banging up against the pier, banging up against each other. A wake could be big enough to actually take a boat out of the water and put it on the pier, right? And so uh, each of us leaves an emotional wake behind us as we're navigating through life. And, you know, one of my goals is to try to minimize that wake and to be aware uh, as I can be about, um, you know, if I have left a wake behind, uh, how do I fix that? It takes a lot of personal responsibility and accountability over your actions because you're not a tornado leaving behind a city that's just in wreck, but you're actually making sure you cause as little tornado as you possibly can. <laughs> and you're disappointed in yourself all the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so speaking of metaphors, you mentioned how you have a metaphor for each of the functions and we went through TE and NI, but I'm wondering what your metaphors are for the other functions. Well, um, extroverted intuition, I think of um, an idea fountain. So this is a fountain that's just constantly bubbling with ideas. Uh, extroverted uh, sensing, I think of as uh, a bird, you know, that has noticed some little piece of tinsel, you know, just something that caught its attention and you know, it's kind of like really focused in on things. Introverted sensing is a, um, it's like a pond. And I think I get this from Jung um, and you drop, and when you drop a rock into the pond, it sends out ripples and the ripples hit the shore and come back and come back. And, you know, and the introverted sense and person isn't really done experiencing whatever they're experiencing in the inner world until the waters are still again. Introverted feeling, but introverted feeling to me is like an old World War II mine. Um, and it's got these, you know, things that stick out. And if a boat comes up and hits it, it explodes. And those things that are sticking out are the introverted feeling person's values. And oftentimes they believe that they're so real to them, they must be visible to everybody else, but they're not. And they can be very accommodating, go along to get along, very accepting until you, know, you hit um, uh, one of those um, values. And then you, you might have an explosion on your hand. And if you know, extroverted thinking is the, um, the inferior and... Uh, you might be facing a person who's normally very nice and very calm who might be a little bit uh, upset with you. Extroverted feeling, I, you know, I, 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 it's hard to, to, um, to think of anything other than a heart um, because I've seen so many ESFJs and ENFJs draw pictures to represent their type and they almost always have a heart in there. They almost always have, um, you know, a circle of people and oftentimes those people are holding hands uh, sort of a thing. So. I think of introverted thinking as a Rube Goldberg machine. Uh, if you've ever seen those video clips, you know, you know what I'm talking about. So, um, you know, a fan blows a, you know, something over and it hits the dominoes. The dominoes go like that, and that. Yeah. So there's, they've got this inner model of the way the world works. It's completely unique to them, um, and they spend a lot of time thinking about here's my outer experiences and how do I, how does it fit in that model. Um, I think I covered all eight. <laughs>
Yeah, yeah. Those are really good imageries that will help people understand the functions in a more symbolic way that it might be a little bit more sticky for them. So thank you so much, Chuck, for that. Well, um, my pleasure. I hope they're helpful. The, um, I, you know, I, I do think the meat of Jung's theory is in those eight Jungian functions. Um, you know, I think Myers and Briggs did a wonderful job of making his theory more accessible to people. Because um, if you've ever read psychological types, it's like going to the dentist without any Novocaine. Um, but, uh, you know, they, they, they did us a valuable service, but I think we, we've gotten a little bit too locked in on um, just the, those preference pairs and we lose sight of the richness of, you know, the, the grip experience and um, type development and, and uh, inner and outer and, and all those things. So, yeah. What is inner and outer? Well, everybody has an inner world and everybody has an outer world. Um, oh, okay. And, and so it doesn't matter whether you're an extrovert or introvert, you, you have both. And we're bilingual. We speak one language inside our head and we deal with other people with a different language. And, uh, and JMP is just, you know, what kind of language is that on the outside? Mm -hmm. And so it's really amazing having you on, Chuck. And so I'm wondering, what resources would you recommend to people who are interested in type and want to find resources? Well, my first thought would be, um, and this is especially true with um, social media, is to make sure that you're, um, you're consulting good resources, um, people that are less, um, less biased or more aware of their biases in terms of how they present type. Um, so that, you know, I think social media is a great place, but you need to really do a lot of screening of the quality of that sort of stuff. Um, I, you know, I know not everybody learns, uh, preferred learning style is to read, um, but everyone can read and everyone can learn in that particular way. So, you know, I advocate uh, reading books. I've got, uh, you know, I've got a, bibliography for type. I've got a bibliography for emotional intelligence. I've got a bibliography for dialogue. I've got a bunch of different, you know, depending on what, what area we're looking at, some recommended books there. Um, taking courses um, from, you know, people that really know and understand type uh, can be helpful. In my view, if you're going to mess with type as a practitioner, you really need to read um, Isabel Myers' Gift Differing. It's the seminal work, and I've read it three times, and each time I read it, I got something out of it that I didn't get the first time. Uh, Kiersey's Temperament Theory, uh, please understand me too. Uh, if you're working with the model, uh, is a is a great help. It helps people. I think it's hardest to read Sensing Intuition in other people, uh, but if you can read Temperament, which is all external behaviors, um, then that gives you the sensing or intuition uh, vote. It's also helpful to get people to best fit to, to take a look at temperament. Roger Pierman's view is, um, you know, it's it's awesome. <laughs> it's, a, it's a really good book about type and you can use it to coach others or use it to coach yourself. Awesome. Thank you for those wonderful book recommendations. And I appreciate you coming out, Chuck. You offer a lot to the type space with your training courses and teaching others about type. And you have this great extensive knowledge on how it intersects with emotional intelligence, leadership, and other theories and models in your NT mind work. <laughs> and so it's really rich how you're able to use type for development and you're able to use type for the betterment of humans. And you're able to use these models to help people with their relationships, with their careers, and with organizations at large. You're really doing the world a service. A couple thoughts. One is, and this I'm quoting uh, Dick Thompson, um, who's in the type community, all models are flawed and some are useful. And I think type is a very useful model. Uh, the flaw all models have where we purport to, to model human behavior is obviously um, the loss of, of richness uh, when you, you, know, you distill people down to even 16 types. I've got an um, a article I wrote called Goldilocks and the 16 Types, um, and I talk about combining models and getting us out to you know, thousands of types, but 
16 is about where most people's brain works. And the, um, I think that in the emotional intelligence world, um, by our psychological type, we are hardwired to make some of the, the aspects of emotional intelligence easier or harder to develop if we want to. For example, um, feeling types, I think their brain is predisposed to, to you know, master empathy, whereas a thinking person is going to have to work harder at that sort of thing. So um, I, I do see a lot of typologic connections in um, the EQI model um, because I use both with, with lots of folks. So. Yeah, I, I do believe in that too. I see type as a starting place. So it tells you where your preferences start, but it doesn't tell you where your potential is limited. There is no ceiling, there is no limit. And so that's why a lot of people have been combining the Myers-Briggs with the Enneagram because it adds a new flavoring to it. And I bet you can combine the Myers-Briggs with every other model that exists out there too. And you'll get a unique flavor palette out of that as well. And it's, it's valid. All of these different flavor palettes are valid. Yeah, I, um, you know, Isabel Myers gave the world a gift um, when she wrote her book *Gifts Differing*. Um, no pun intended. And um, you know, I, I I think what she really adds to the conversation is, it's okay to be you. Um, you have a way of going through life. It's pattern. Your, your pattern is similar to thousands of others. You're okay. Millions of others, really. Um, and so the good news is, you know, it's validating for people. But I was very frustrated when I first learned about type because there wasn't a whole lot of, it's like, you know, here's your type, love your type. But there wasn't a whole lot of what's the downside or where's my blind spots or how do I grow and develop? And and so the Enneagram, um, you know, is definitely uh, goes to that particular place. And um, recognizing how the two combine in ways that, that can make can maximize a you know a limitation that you have, or how one can um, you know kind of compensate for a um, you know an aspect of yourself that is not good. You know, one model compensates for the other, or how they can combine um, to give you kind of a gift, um, an extra well developed gift. So, um, the enneagram I think is a really worthwhile model if you want to get into growth and development. It's big barrier is most people read their you know all six or all nine type descriptions and say I don't really want to be any of those. <laughs> so um, you know that's the it's it's looking at the dark side if you will. Yeah, my belief is that the MBTI could have a dark side to it too. It, no one has gone there yet, so it has the potential to tap into that. It's just an untapped kind of area. It has potential for development there, but you're right. The enneagram already currently focuses on the dark side. And so it provides you this area of growth and it provides you, you know this, so now you can change this. Um, but so Chuck, I'm wondering what your Enneagram type is. I'm an Enneagram one. And so um, critiquing um, and perfectionism, um, you know, double down on a, on a, on a bad thing <laughs> that I've had to, I really had to work on. Um, and uh, I, I find um, I am better able to um, kind of step outside of my Enneagram type than I am um, able to step outside of my MBTI type. Yeah, that makes a whole lot of sense. <laughs> and so thanks, Chuck, for providing that. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> it's really great to see how looking at all the models and trying to take what's helpful and then leave the rest. It's a really good way of looking at it because, yeah, models are, are useful. And so they don't have to be taken as fully gospel for everything because people are dynamic. Nature and nurture really impact how types manifest. And so one INFJ preference person can look very different from another INFJ preference person due to their different modeling in other places. So it's nice to account for all the variables. It, it would be really nice um, to have a integrating approach with many different models and perspectives there. Well, unfortunately, I think a lot of practitioners latch onto one model and then they try to, you know, it's the hammer, you know, if every, um, if the only tool you have is a hammer, then everything looks like a nail kind of a thing. But it, it you've got to, you know, it takes time to learn a bunch of different models. It really does. Yeah. So I like your open-minded approach, looking at all those different models. 
Uh, and it was really great talking with you. You are a well in sea of knowledge and you, <laughs> you leave behind very positive wakes. So there are, are negative wakes and then there are positive thank ones. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I appreciate it. <laughs> so thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to talk. Uh, let me thank you for, for the energy that you're clearly putting into a very um, useful framework and, uh, and how you're influencing um, uh, you know, young folk. I think that's, that's great. Um, we need more folks like that there like you. Of course, yeah. It's great chatting with you. And I think you're a wonderful example of someone who's using type for good and knows the applications of it that cause growth, happiness, health, and all things positive in people's lives. And you know when a model is useful and you know when to to, to, to stop at certain points too. <laughs> all right. All right. And so thanks everyone for watching. We'll see you all in the next episode. Bye. Thank you.